So many women juggle work, raising kids, and staying connected with loved ones while often putting their own health and well being on the back burner. But taking care of yourself first is crucial to making sure you're healthy enough to look after your loved ones. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikki Mohan, your host for today's discussion, coming to you from the Baptist Health Newsroom. Today, our conversation is all about understanding women's health, from reproductive health to mental wellness, and more by prioritizing and investing in women's health, we can improve the overall well-being of women, their families, and the community. Here to talk to us about how women can make their health a priority more, we are joined by two Baptist health experts, primary care physician, Dr. Kat Kathleen Filiaggi, and gynecologist, Dr. Pita Kavanza. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh my goodness, before we dive into today's subject, which is always a hot topic, I wanna to remind our viewers to send in their questions, their comments in the comments section throughout this discussion. We're here for you and happy to answer any questions you may have. We're gonna start with Dr. Filaji, uh, juggling the whole family schedules, keeping up with appointments, doing a good job at work, striving to be a good mom. Are you getting anxiety already? It's, it's, it's taking a, a toll on women's health. And it's something you know well, being a mom, being a doctor, being a wife. Um, what kind of tips do you offer for how to avoid burnout? And what do you tell your patients? You're right. I, I just feel in general, as women, we are multitaskers. We are regularly trying to do as much as we possibly can, oftentimes in as little time as possible. We're juggling, as you had mentioned, being a mother, being a partner, being an organizer, being a scheduler, being a chauffeur. Um, that takes a toll in terms of our time as women to be able to exercise, to be able to get regular sleep, to be able to have time for ourselves and to be able to take care of our health. Um, sometimes uh, these demands can increase stress and ultimately end up leading to burnout. Um, what's important is to keep uh, an eye out for the signs and symptoms of burnout. Um, burnout does include sense of failure and self-doubt, um, developing feelings of helplessness, um, feeling uh, defeated, uh, starting to feel more detached and alone, uh, starting to feel much uh, less motivated, uh, feeling, uh, becoming more negative or becoming more uh, cynical, uh, having um, uh, more unexplained um, exhaustion and fatigue. Um, to start, is there anything that can be done to try to help alleviate these demands? Are there other people that can help out? Um, can there be conversations with work to see if can anything be done with the work schedule? Can there be a conversation with a friend or family uh, for an outlet? Uh, try to do um, some stress relief, if possible, with all that, that that entails. Is there time for exercise? Can there be improvement in sleep? Uh, can time be made to have some time for yourself to have a break? If not, um, if this all becomes difficult to manage, then it's time to have a conversation with your primary care physician. Um, when you meet with your primary care physician, not to be afraid to be upfront and honest what's happening and what's going on because we are here to help. Yeah, I mean, so much, you know, people don't realize how much of uh, primary health care is also balancing mental health as well. Because if you don't feel good about yourself, you're not going to take care of yourself, right, right. doctor? Absolutely. Yes. You know, oh, we're going to go to Dr. Kavanza now, uh, or Dr. PK, his hip, his hip side name, also known as. Um, this has been a hot topic when it comes to women's health in the media now, because more people are talking about perimenopause and menopause, um, you know, Recently on social media with celebrities like Michelle Obama, Oprah, Salma Hayek, and Naomi Watts, all of them were opening up about their own experiences. Um, so we were, break it all down for us. What's the difference between perimenopause and menopause? And how, how do you prepare your patients for these hormonal phases and to be aware of them? Great question, Nikki. Uh, we essentially describe and define menopause as a, as a journey. Usually we define it 
by textbooks as the age where a woman has got at least 12 consecutive months without a period. However, not all women fit that criteria. There's some women that have not had a period for several months in a row. In addition to that, they have elevation in some hormones. One of them is called FSH. And lastly, they have symptoms. And those symptoms can vary from insomnia, irritability, night sweats, mood changes, vaginal dryness, painful intimacy, urinary incontinence, some of those or all of those. And they can accumulate over time. The average age of menopause in a woman in the United States is around 51. However, some women can transition and have it a little bit earlier, on the early 40s, some a little bit later on the mid 50s. When women might reach menopause or lack a period, it could be because of medications. If that woman unfortunately has had chemotherapy or radiation treatment that affect the ovaries, that woman can reach, unfortunately, menopause through an extrinsic reason, not because of her own journey that has happened and eventually will happen over time. Other women that might undergo surgery and might have removal of the ovaries at a time of a hysterectomy might surgically then lose the their hormonal uh, factory of estrogen and progesterone and unfortunately become menopausal because of the surgery. So the perimenopause is then that time prior to that continuous absence of menses with or without those various symptoms. So women might be on 45, have her menstrual cycle every month, but then having issues with night sweats, insomnia. We do the blood work. She's not menopausal yet, but she's symptomatic, beginning to have irregular periods. We call it peri, you know, from the Greek around menopause. So it's the time frame around the menopause. And the menopause is when they fully have stopped their cycles and then don't have any more periods together with all the other symptoms. Yeah, I mean, it's so great to hear you talking about it. I wish we all could be married to a gynecologist because it's so important that that, you know, we have these conversations with our partners and maybe Dr. Falaji, you can relate to this from your patients. You know, men feel like they're at a loss and we're going through so many changes. Isn't it how important it is to talk about this with your partners so they know what's going on and know it's not the end of your life? You're absolutely right. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we are here all the time. I mean, and really and truly around this time, it's really important to stay on top of your health screenings. Why is it especially important during this time, Dr. Falaji? Because um, health screening, it's screening for the development of medical conditions or it's catching medical conditions early. Um, The health screening occurs um, at the annual wellness visits where uh, during the annual wellness visit, there is age and sex appropriate screening that is occurring. Um, And uh, examples of the screening include monitoring the vitals, making sure that we're not starting to develop issues with high blood pressure, helping to keep an eye on weight, um, blood testing to help monitor for uh, and screen for diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, having the uh, manugra- um, annual mammograms to screen for um, breast cancer, uh, colonoscopies or using the little uh, stool cards to monitor for uh, colon cancer. My patients hear it all the time that uh, one of the most preventable um, cancers is colon cancer, but to prevent it, the screening has to occur. And uh, these screenings are in place uh, to keep us healthy and alive so that we can be with our families. Yeah. I may be a little juvenile and giggle now because you said those little stool thingies. I did that <laughs> once. It is so vile, but it's much easier than a colonoscopy because I've done that too. <laughs> but then sometimes if you do the colonoscopy, then it could be all one and done because- I like the colonoscopy because of the sleep, quite frankly, because yeah. I'm having issues with my sleep. I'm 51, Dr. TK, I'm telling you. So- <laughs> Well, you don't look it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But I'll tell you something, my, my, I feel it. And my, I'm sure my blood work will tell it. Dr. PK, when you, how important is blood work when you go to the doctor for your regular screening? Because that's something I feel like I, sometimes I have to beg for, but how important is it for you as a gynecologist to look at my blood work, to let me know what's going on in my life right now? To, to second Dr. Filiagi, that, that is part of the women's wellness. Cause I think, um, Healthy women are the backbone of a resilient and striving society. Mm-hmm. And we as, as, as healthcare providers 
have an important part, an important role in guiding women, educating them by maintaining them healthy. And part of that is only the routine cytology or pap smear, but doing blood work, at least in my practice at the Miami Institute for Women's Health, part of bringing women up to date is doing what Dr. Filaji mentioned, doing the blood work. Because sometimes we identify thyroid issues. We check the blood pressures, the weight issues. Not only are the issues that are gynecological of concern, but if we're able to identify issues with high blood pressure, cardiac disease, we hopefully can guide them to, you know, some of my colleagues to manage that particular issue. Um, the blood work, in addition, you know, of the cholesterol, the thyroid studies, the women hormones to see their entering menopause. Sometimes patients might complain of some uh, joint aches, and we can then start delineating lab work for any rheumatoid arthritis or lupus that might go into that. So we can definitely tailor the patient's history and complaints to dedicate a particular lab work for that particular patient. But primarily, uh, as I second Dr. Filiagi, is educating that patient of the needs of keeping yourself healthy, but also empowering them to, by staying healthy, be able to continue to contribute to their family and society to their work. How important is that you have a primary and an OBGYN, Dr. Filiagi? Because I know a lot of people who just have an OBGYN mm -hmm. and some insurances encouraged you like say, yeah, you can use that as your primary. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, there. Cause you guys seem we, like you communicate and you yes, both do the, your loot, but you do different things than, than, than Dr. Peter you're, does. you're correct. And, um, OBGYN is a specialty, whereas, um, a primary care physician, whether it be an internist or a family practitioner, we, um, are more uh, general medicine. And then uh, we have set uh, screening, as I mentioned, uh, both yeah. uh, for um, age and sex screening that occurs, because I'm not so sure that Dr. Yeah. PK would be ordering a colonoscopy. <laughs> I could be yeah. wrong, but <laughs> I don't see him ordering the colonoscopy. Yeah. Um, we, and that because things like that. Oh, do you? I apologize yes. that yeah. you know no, no, that we. Okay. Uh, but you but, guys check a lot of a lot of different things, so it's important absolutely. to have both. Yes, to have both. Dr. PK, there's so many more reasons why women should know more about their pelvic health beyond just going to the bathroom. <laughs> what do women? What should women really focus on when it talks when you're talking about pelvic health? The, the, the dialogue of pelvic health is extremely important regardless of the age of the patient. And, and to add a little bit to the conversation prior about having an OBGYN in a, in a primary care, uh, sometimes the relationship of my patients take me through the journey when I have seen that patient from teenage years doing the first pap smear, introducing them to birth control. And that is very parallel to what Dr. Filiagi yeah. might do in her practice. Now, if I start that journey and then they come and get pregnant, I will see them then for that pregnancy journey. And then from there, they might either go back to Dr. Filiagi for the routine health care. However, some people who have not had you know, the pleasure or had the opportunity to have a primary care Dr. Filiagi, we then at least embark on that journey of keeping then their journey of their not only sexual health, their uh, well woman's visits, but also as they move along in their journey, doing the colonoscopy screen, encourage them to do that, doing any blood pressure monitoring, et cetera. So I do not put my primary hat in those visits because sometimes I do understand that they do not have a primary physician. Those that they do or those who have patients uh, who have uh, um, other medical issues like diabetes or, or hypertension, then they will follow those uh, particular problems with them. To go yeah. back then to the question of, of pelvic health, it is very important because those issues can vary between age. There are some people that after the delivery might have problems with stress incontinence or stool incontinence, might have issue with pelvic relaxation or prolapse. That really becomes more obvious as a woman matures that they become symptomatic and they do not know what to do. They might say, well, you know, my mom had that. I was sharing with my mom and I guess it's part of maturing and getting older or having three kids. But unfortunately, this is where we need to educate. No, you cannot, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to wear pads every day because you're sneezing and having an episode of, you know, urinary incontinence. You don't have to, you know, keep buying gels or, or, or lubes because you're having painful intimacy. Make sure you have that relationship with your physician where you're open and able to ask questions. Is this normal? So that way we can guide you in that questions in how to improve that sexual health um because the the 
the pelvic relaxation, the stress incontinence is only a minute part of some of the changes that happen vaginally. Uh, and then certainly as we mature, some things get worsened that might need surgery, other ones might need medication. Some other times we need other alternatives, non-surgical treatments that we can improve some of those aspects. Oh, you're so good at talking about yes. that. More, we, need to, we need to push this out because it's not an easy thing to talk about that. So thank you so much for spelling that out for me. This is a really good time, uh, folks, to let you to, to let our viewers know about two great resources for women's health we have here at Baptist Health, our Mommy Matters program, talks with our experts, support groups, and so much more that, um, you know, that you can go to baptisthealth.net slash community health. We also have our Barbara C. Guten pre- and postpartum program at the Linz Women's Institute at the Boca Raton Regional Hospital. For that, you can go to BRR h.com slash gluten right here up on your screen. Going back to Dr. Falaji, we hear about the importance of eating healthy and exercising. How pivotal is that heart healthy lifestyle to lower our risk of heart disease? We know that women are still most at risk for all these heart problems because we don't take time for ourselves. When yes. do you take time for yourself in all the things that you have to do? How about that? Okay. Me, I try to go for a run in the morning. It has to be in the morning, but if I can get if I can accomplish some form of exercise in the mo in the morning before my day begins, um, then um, I'm happy. But mm -hmm. overall, a heart healthy a lifestyle uh, does help to reduce the risk of vascular disease. Vascular disease does include stroke, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and heart disease. Right now, the CDC does list heart disease as the number one cause of death in women. So whatever can be done to try to help prevent heart disease in women, the better. Uh, the, main risk, uh, the main risk factors for heart disease are increasing age, uh, family history, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, increased weight, decreased physical activity. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do anything at all about who our parents were or uh, increasing age. Um, smoking is a major risk factor for heart disease. So ideally do whatever, whenever the decision is made to stop smoking, to try to do whatever can be done to try to stop smoking. And if there needs to be help with smoking, we are here to help with smoking cessation. Um, the rest of the uh, risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, increased weight and decreased physical activity can all be prevented or improved through a heart healthy uh, lifestyle and diet. Yeah, no, and it's important. You know what's really good in helping you stay on top of all that? Saying no, yes. no to everybody. <laughs> and you come to my house, it's a mess, but guess what? I've worked out. So <laughs> Dr. PK, women experience menopause at different times. Um, some may think that they no longer during that time have to be seen annually by their OBGYN. Um, should women in menopause continue their yearly pap smear? Absolutely. Normally, the, the recommendations from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends cytology or pap smears until age 65. Uh, however, if a woman has had a hysterectomy, I still tell them, okay, we don't have to do a pap smear, but we need to continue checking that well woman checkup. And again, if they don't have a primary care or they're using me as their, you know, essentially, um, uh, person to keep their health, I want to make sure they have their mammogram. As Dr. Filiaji mentioned, you know, talk about, you know, tobacco cessation, take five minutes to, you know, guide them in, in that journey of trying to quit, checking their blood pressure. But also then I then on during the exam, take charge about their vaginal health. And as they mature, explain them what's going on. If they're having any issues of painful sex, vaginal uh, dryness, incontinence, um, and having any issues that during um, intimacy, it could be uh, uh, painful and address those issues as well. So the yearly exam uh, at times, even if they might not need a cytology, it is encouraged. We can address all those many issues that can be then uh, detailed of how we can uh, uh, improve them. Yeah. And breaking news just a few days ago, they also uh, unleashed some new breast cancer screening guidelines. Um, both of you guys can chime in on this. Dr. Filaji, you know, when this came down, you know, how necessary was it? And why? Well, um, I know that uh, 
with breast cancer screening, ideally trying to catch it early because um, that's what's most important with the screening is catching it. And if there's a positive family history, starting the screening early. Um, and uh, if a mammogram shows uh, an area of concern, evaluating further with additional imaging. Yeah, they moved the screening for what was the recommended age? Was it 45 or 40, uh, the, the Dr. PK? No, no recommendations are 40, which is what we've been doing, at least in the Miami Institute. We've been always doing 40. So that change really didn't affect our recommendations. But I'm glad that they're now more uniformly enhanced and we have guidelines for everybody because some women might not know. Those, of course, who don't have any family history or have maybe any familiar genetic mutations that are of high risk for um, family history of, of breast cancer, so, such as BRAC mutation one or two, we then tend to do earlier screenings. But normally, uniformly, we start at age 40 for mammography. I started at 50 for bone densitometry and also then colonoscopy at age 45. So I use 40 for mammograms, 45 for colonoscopy, 54 DEXA scans. In that way, at least we get all that, all those benefits of maintaining and keeping healthy. Yeah, and I mean, especially especially in the case of colonoscopy, if you have like a family history, it's very, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we've known that screening really matters if you've had a, a, a family history. Um, doctors, thank you so much, um, you know, for this. We, uh, it's such great, and I'm Dr. PK, you're so great. You can be like on Sex and the City <laughs> talking about this stuff because this is, these are not easy things to talk about <laughs> and you just put them in such digestible format. I know our viewers will appreciate all that you've put in here. Dr. Filaji, Dr. PK, thank you so much and continue to do the great work you do. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you for viewing everyone. Um, remember viewers, you can also hit the subscribe button on our channel to keep up with the latest health and wellness information and tips from our experts. You can also connect with us on all our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. And check out our resource blog for the latest news at baptisthealth.net slash news. You can also find a link there to all episodes of the Baptist Health Talk podcast as well. On behalf of everyone here at Baptist Health, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for watching. Thank you.